Good evening, everybody. I think I can say good evening. Now it's five o'clock and welcome to another of our Oxford Sparks live Q&As. Uh, for those of you who don't know, these are Q&As that we're doing every week as part of our Science at Home campaign. And so if you're new here, then please do consider subscribing um, because it would be fantastic to hear about all the things that you've been um, up to. Um, and uh, you can pop any questions that you have in the chat box um, underneath the videos, even if they're already published, and we can see if the scientists will respond to those. And um, do consider subscribing, um, as I said, and do check us out on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as well, where we're putting up everything that we're doing, including our new animations and podcasts and things like that. So uh, without further ado, I will introduce today's uh, researcher who we're going to be chatting to. And they are Associate Professor in the Department of Engineering here at Oxford and lead of the Battery Intelligence Lab. And I'm really excited to hear all about that. Um, so I will hand over to Professor David Howie. Hello. Hello. Nice to see you. How's it going? Great to see you. <laughs> yes, not bad. Thank you. It is... Uh, Nice and sunny for, I assume most of our uh, people watching today will be UK based. So hopefully you've also been fortunate with the weather wherever you are. Um, and yes, even if we're we're mostly restricted to being inside, it's, it's quite cheerful. So um, yes, uh, well, I think you can probably introduce yourself a lot better than I. So uh, maybe you could just tell people a little bit about the research that you're doing. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, in the current situation, maybe a, a little bit about how you've been able to manage with that and uh, yeah, about the Battery Intelligence Lab, because as you say, it, it sounds uh, intriguing. Great. Yeah, thanks very much. Uh, it's great to be invited to do this. Uh, so thanks for organising it. Um, and I should say a big shout out to Sam from my group, who's um, been controlling Twitter uh, on your behalf today and has done a really great Absolutely. job. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Sorry, I was just going to say he's done an absolutely fantastic job and anybody um, who hasn't seen his post today should go and check them out. You can just go to our page and scroll down and take a look because uh, he's been telling us all about. I feel I've had a bit of an introduction and looking forward to, hear to hearing more from you. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, definitely. Uh, so, yeah, so the Battery Intelligence Lab is, is my research group in engineering science. Uh, we, we're about 10 people um, and we are interested in batteries, obviously, um, but we are engineers so we're not coming at it from a materials chemistry point of view. We're mainly interested in how to model and control and use batteries effectively. Um, and most of what we look at is lithium ion batteries, which has become the dominant technology these days. Um, although we do a little bit of work on other stuff as well. Um, so that that's us really. Um, we are a fairly diverse group from all around the world. Um, we've got a um, uh, pretty, pretty cool bunch of people. We've got people from, let me see, Finland. We've got people from oh, wow. Belgium. We've got people from uh, a whole bunch of other countries. I won't list them all. Um, <laughs> that's yeah, great. That's yeah, nice. <laughs> I, I do love hearing about all of these diverse groups. It's one of the, the really nice things about being a researcher is that you get these experts from all over the place coming together and, and sharing their ideas. And um, yeah, that's really fantastic. Um, so maybe a good place to start is what made you, before we kind of delve into to the nitty gritty of your research, like why did you decide to study engineering? Because it's not a subject that is on offer at school. You know, you do biology, chemistry, physics, and um, yeah, what made you decide to, to go into that field? Yeah, great question. Um, <laughs> so I suppose engineering, where do, where do we start? Um, I guess I'm one of these people who is slightly wired to be an engineer in some senses because my dad's an engineer and my granddad actually was a sort of engineer, but he was actually quite interesting. He went down the mines in the northeast, so he's from so my dad. My dad's family from the northeast, sort of mm -hmm. Sunderland area. Um, uh, so he went down the mines at the age of 14. <laughs> um, wow. So kind of a real practical kind of uh, um, uh, stream there. But um, I don't think that means that we all have to be genetically wired to be engineers at all. It just happens to have been the case in my in my situation. Um, but um, um, as a result of that, you know, I've always been interested in sort of practical applications of science and um, seeing things work. Um, and, you know, in the classic sort of cliche that I enjoyed maths and physics and that kind of stuff. But, you know, to, to add to that, I think the thing that makes engineering a little bit different to science, natural science, is that there's this design aspect. So it's actually, there's a kind of creativity and design aspect that involves making decisions and thinking about how people use things and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so I think uh, that's what really attracted me to engineering is the fact that there's this decision-making design aspect. 
Um, and, you know, all through my teenage years, I was also someone who liked to just build things and kind of fiddle around with electronics and that kind of thing as well, which I, used to be, it used to be uncool and it's now cool. So that's good. It's very cool. <laughs> I was just going to say, were you one of these kids who was always taking things apart and putting it back together again? And um, it sounds like maybe so. <laughs> I um, was, but actually I blew a few things up, which then made me, as actually made me quite risk averse now, <laughs> nowadays. I remember when I, I, this is back in the, I'm showing my age, back in the nineties, um, I built a circuit that I plugged into our computer and I kind of took out some bit of our computer you know there was a kind of smell of burning electronics and uh and after that i kind of learned the hard way that you should always be a, you should be a little bit more cautious <laughs> before you plug your projects into your parents uh computer <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah but see it's all worth it in the end with where you are now but yes maybe uh learn through experience there um Great. So uh, I should just say at this point, um, because I didn't say at the start, we are obviously live. And one of the great things about that is that you at home who are watching and listening uh, can ask your questions while David is with us. So uh, please do pop them in the chat box and we will do our best to get them answered. But while you kind of warm up and think of those questions, um, I've got a little list here. So I was kind of uh, thinking about batteries and uh we're just so used to them being part of our lives. But when were they actually invented? Where do they come from? How long have we had them? Oh, that is a good one. Um, so batteries, um, actually, they go back quite a long, quite a long way, you know, over, over about 200 years. Um, in fact, in that sense, they kind of predate the electricity power grid. Okay, so there was a period of time, I find this kind of curious, that there was this period of time where the only way you could get a source of electricity was from a battery, not by plugging something into your your electricity socket in your house or whatever so actually uh, i'm off on an aside here but there's this interesting period of history where scientists were doing experiments where they needed a power source and, and the power source inevitably was a battery but um to to answer your question um uh the history goes back to, I guess, about 1780. So Galvani was di dissecting a frog. You might have heard this story before. It's a little bit gross, but um, he was dis dissecting a frog, which was attached to a kind of brass hook. And he uh, had an, his scalpel and he kind of touched the frog with his scalpel and the leg jumped. <laughs> and, uh, and he thought it was um, some kind of something within the frog itself and he called it animal electricity and then he went and had a ch chat with his friend alessandra volta another scientist you know they <laughs> had this to be his friend <laughs> exactly uh, uh so they had a classic kind of scientific disagreement and volta thought actually it was just two different metals which were joined by something in between which was this um kind of moist uh material in between um and uh in the end, uh, it wasn't animal electricity. <laughs> so yeah. Volta was Volta was correct, and uh, at around 1800, he invented the first battery, which was this pile of different metals with kind of um, briny stuff in between. Uh, which and what that does is basically allows ions to move between between the metals and complete the circuit. Um, so in doing that, you you get a kind of voltage source, and if you connect lots of them in series, you can get to a higher voltage and now we have batteries weirdly enough the word battery itself of course just means like a kind of uh you know array of things and that was actually coined by um benjamin franklin um to describe some capacitors linked together so there you go history lesson over history lesson. <laughs> i liked it you tuned in for engineering got a bit of history on the side and um yeah i find that animal electricity i'm a biologist so that's particularly intriguing for me but uh turned out not to be um so <laughs> just sort of to to, well, I was going to say power on through and it was a bad pun, but um, <laughs> to continue with, uh, you were saying a little bit about lithium ion batteries earlier and a lot of people will probably have heard of those. I've used them myself, but what is it about those that make them special? How are they different? Yeah, so, um, so lithium ion, the history of this goes back to about the early 80s, um, where at the time, of course, uh, the, the main battery in, say, people's cars or whatever, which kind of still is, is lead acid. Um, and lead acid is a very old type of battery. Um, but NASA had been doing a lot of research around fuel cells and batteries and stuff through the 60s and 70s and all that kind of stuff. And, of course, there was the... Um, the oil crash in the 70s. So there was a lot of interest in rene renewable energy and that kind of thing. Um, anyway, so so throughout that period, there was this research going on to try and get, get a better battery um, together. And in the early 80s, there were some breakthroughs, which I won't go into super detail, but the Nobel Prize was awarded last year to uh, Goodenough and, and his yes. colleagues around yeah. these uh, breakthroughs, which is super exciting. And actually, Goodenough himself was, was based um, in Oxford, 
at the time. Um, and uh, so, the, so lithium ion goes back. What was that? Forty years. But it was only really commercialized in the in the nineties, the early nineties, by Sony. Um, so there was, you know, a good ten tenish year gap between uh, when it was first invented or discovered, and there was you know, iterations along the way, and then finally commercialized for things like camcorders in the early 90s. So this is pre kind of mobile phones as we have them today. Yeah. But there was this camcorder boom, everyone was recording VHS home videos. And so a lithium ion was going into that. But of course, today, you know, I'm sitting here on my on my laptop, um, the battery on this will last for hours, it's amazing. Uh, battery on my phone will will generally last a, a day. And we whinge about that. But of course, it's extraordinary that that exists, because 20, 30, 40 years ago there was no alternative i mean if you if you had a phone in your car uh in the 80s it would have been like a massive brick and it would yeah. run off your car <laughs> so you know, when you, the, the way to make a phone call was to go and sit in your car and then uh you've got your whole power source there <laughs> exactly i was watching life on mars recently where they have the, the car phone and i was thinking wow <laughs> great you know, program if they could see now what we have oh it is um good lockdown yeah for you but yeah um yeah that's really interesting and we actually had a question in while you were chatting about lithium ion batteries um someone it's nice asked, to know someone's watching <laughs> yeah, yeah don't worry about that we've had another couple in since i started talking so um yes uh are lithium ion batteries space tech i guess there's been a lot of attention on space recently with the spacex launch and whatnot um but yeah. i don't know what you'd say to that that is a really good question, and I'm not sure I fully can give the answer to that. But um, I think, what could I say? Um, a lot of space tech related to batteries was, was, in my view, along the lines of things like fuel cells. Because with a fuel cell, you know, you've got hydrogen and oxygen, and you get water out the other end, which is actually, it can be drunk by the astronauts. So you kind of get, you get... Uh, you get water and you get electricity. I mean, wow. obviously, batteries are important in in lots of applications, including aerospace as well. But I'm um, I'm not a hundred percent sure whether space was the driving motivation behind the the stuff that happened with lithium ion. I suspect probably not, but I'd have to go check. Yeah, it's an interesting thing to think about. But um... I think it was more blue skies research, you know, being done by yeah. um, by the guys who won the Nobel Prize last year. Yeah, which was so so exciting, by the way. I just yeah. kind of glossed over that, just casually saying the Nobel Prize. But uh, I saw some yeah. about that earlier, and of course there was a lot of buzz around Oxford when that happened. So um, yeah, really really good. Um, so uh, we've had somebody very kindly saying that they really enjoyed your background. Um, <laughs> Do you see a role for lead acid batteries in like 10 years time or do you expect to see all of them replaced by lithium? That's a really good question. So if you'd asked me that five or 10 years ago, I would have said yes, definitely. Um, but in the last two years, things are moving so fast with lithium ion that I'm not really sure now. Um, uh, so lead acid is, is really old technology and it's in many ways it's good technology, right? It's um, it's it's easy to recycle. Um, it's relatively simple. You can overcharge it without, you know, too many repercussions. Although overcharging any battery is a bad idea, by the way. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, so don't do that. But uh, lead acid is is yeah. So it's relatively robust technology. The downside is it has a relatively low energy density. So how much energy you can get in or out for a certain amount of weight or volume. Clearly, like using lead, one of the heaviest or densest uh, metals <laughs> for a battery is a bad idea. Um, but um, yeah, so what could I say? I think, yeah, it will be around for a while because, you know, even if we switch over to EVs pretty quickly, there's still going to be a lot of applications which uh, are more conventional vehicles, uh, combustion engines, trucks, that kind of thing. And, and those tend to use lead acid as a starter battery. So uh, I can certainly see that lasting for a good, a good decade or two. But the rapid increase in lithium ion is just extraordinary. You know, the prices have dropped far faster than people thought five or 10 years ago, similar to solar PV. And this puts the world in actually quite an exciting place, I think. Uh, because there's, yeah. you know, we're starting starting to see that the cost of putting, say, a, a gigawatt of solar and a gigawatt of batteries on the power grid in California is starting to look competitive, um, and soon it will be competitive. Uh, it will actually be che cheaper to do this soon, within a few years, than to continue running an existing power plant. Uh, so that's wow. really amazing, because at that point you start to really accelerate um, into yeah, another, that's... yeah. So interesting. We were chatting a few weeks ago to um, Philip Greenwald about his research into renewable energies and where we're at and how energy use is changing. So I think it'd be really 
interesting to watch these two discussions together and just see how it's all coming together. And I think it's such an exciting time, as you're saying. Um, I'm a little bit distracted because the chat box is going a little crazy. I'm having to catch up on these questions. Um, I bet someone knows more about space and batteries <laughs> in the 70s than I do. No <laughs> commenting. Um, but, uh, so Martin asks, which batteries work best in cold environments? Is that lithium ion? Or... Because there's a, an, quite an, a, a thing about batteries not lasting when they're cold, isn't there? Yeah, that's another great question, actually. So, um, I mean, in general, a lot of batteries are not great in cold. Um, and we'll, we'll, um, we probably appreciate this if, if anyone's um, into sort of mountain hiking and that kind of thing, and you've been doing any mountaineering and at, at colder temperatures, you'll notice your battery isn't that great. Um, uh, the reason for this, by the way, is, is multitude of reasons, but the, uh, there's two things that happen. The, the reactions kind of slow down, the kinetics kind of gets worse, um, but also the um, the voltage, the thermodynamics changes slightly and, and detrimentally. But um, uh, so the, the solution, unfortunately, is to heat the battery up. And this is an issue for electric cars as well. And so there's quite a lot of work um, being done on pre heat mechanisms for electric cars um, but it, it it's it's it they work i mean norway has a lot of electric cars it's a cold place <laughs> so i think it's a, it's a situation where engineering solutions have kind of solved that problem mm -hmm. um, but i i guess it would be nice if if we could develop new types of electrolytes and, and new types of batteries which would work especially well at, at colder temperatures yeah absolutely um I'd, we obviously sort of just went on to electric cars there, and I'm really keen to talk to you about electric vehicles before we finish. Um, I'm just going to uh, sort of wrap up a bit about uh, batteries more in general. I've um, got a question. Do you think there's a place for both BEVs and hydrogen fuel cells in the future, or are you putting your bets on batteries? Um, and there's actually a question that's linked, which is how, um, how are your lab results reducing, reducing the costs of BEVs, which, I don't know, maybe ties in. Um, yeah. Interesting questions, everybody. So let's take the first one, and then I'll come to the thing. So the first one was about fuel cell vehicles versus electric vehicles. Uh, yeah, tricky one to be drawn on. I mean, there's there's been a little bit of a kind of, uh, how can I say, not, not a polarized discussion, but, you know, there, there are definitely people who are, like, very pro fuel cell, people are very pro EV, and, and certainly 10 years ago, it was maybe a bit more polarized. I think the reality now is that, you know, fuel cell vehicles in the end are electric vehicles. They, they have motors, they will have some kind of battery, they will have the same kind of power electronics and stuff as an electric vehicle. So they're not a million miles different, <laughs> excuse the pun, to an electric vehicle. Um, uh, it's really a question of whether fuel cells are commercially viable compared to electric vehicles at this present time. And I think um, the, the, the cost of batteries uh, and the viability of electric vehicles is changing very quickly. The cost of fuel cell vehicles has definitely come down, and there are, uh, there are some really good kind of examples of vehicles mm -hmm. out there. Um, if Honestly, I, I'm not sure that we're quite there at the same point with fuel cell vehicles as we are at, with EVs. But... For sure, it's a great technology, and it's one that we, um, I would say, probably need, especially for vehicles like longer-range, kind of heavy-duty vehicles. But would I put money on one or the other? Um, I won't be drawn on that because, you know, batteries have blown away everyone's expectations um, since five or ten years ago. So yeah. it's difficult. Yeah, they might do that for heavy-duty vehicles as well. Yeah. Um, so, so. I know this is a bit of putting you on the spot question, but are we are we all going to be driving electric vehicles one day? Um, do you, is that the way things going? Like, are we? I know you're working a lot uh, in your lab about how we might be able to power those. So maybe in uh, we're sort of moving into the last ten minutes, you could tell us a bit more um, about that. Obviously, the last question led in nicely. Mm. Yeah, and I didn't answer your second question, so I'll come back oh, to yes. that's uh, as much how as I. Sorry, Anna. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll come back to how I work. How our work relates to this in a sec. But um, just to pick up on that question, um, are we all going to be driving EVs? It's a it's a good question. I mean, honestly, should we all be driving cars or should we be walking, wow. cycling, etc.? That's a that, question. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, in the current situation that we're in, I mean, my car is sitting on the driveway, not being used very much. Um, and I think a lot of us are, are thinking long and hard about that and and ho hopefully and are thinking, you know, isn't this better and maybe we could do things differently. So I think um, some of us will be driving EVs and I think the rate of adoption or the rate of switch over to EVs will be fairly 
quick and maybe quicker than we expect. And there's been some great work on this, uh, by the way, by people like the Faraday Institution, Bloomberg, and people like that. So there's good predictions on this, which are quite interesting. But um, but I also uh, think people are getting really excited about things like e-bikes. You know, so uh, it isn't just yeah. are you going to ditch your uh, ICE car, your combustion engine car, and, and jump into an electric car and still clog up the streets. Actually, maybe we need to think a bit more. Maybe an e-bike would would be the thing to go for, or whatever. Um, That's very true. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, so then coming to your other question, which is about our, our research and how does that relate to this? Um, maybe you could, I don't know if you could read that question to me again, because it was quite specific the way it was worded. Um, yes, <laughs> so, um, well, one of my questions um, sort of related to um, electric vehicles, but the question that came in was about how your lab results are reducing the cost of BEVs, right. which kind of touched what I was going to ask. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, um, I mean, the first thing I should say is not all of our work relates to electric vehicles. Um, we do quite a lot of work on grid grid connected batteries mm -hmm. as well. Um, but uh, the kind of work that we do, you know, is, as I said earlier, is more related to how you use batteries and how you control them and how you estimate things like state of charge uh, rather than making a new type of battery. Um, so how does that relate to the cost of something like an EV coming down is a great question. Um, I guess it relates in a number of ways. One is that if we can understand by modeling and control the limits of what a battery can do better, then we can squeeze a bit more out at the margins. So for example, um, typically in these systems, there's, there's, a, there's a margin of five or 10% at the top of the state of charge region and the bottom of the state of charge. You know, you don't want to push too high or too low. And that's yeah. for, for, for lots of reasons, but you know, safety, lifetime, et cetera. And um, I think by having improved models, which can predict what's happening in those regions, you yeah. can then maybe venture into those regions a bit more. And so a, a good example with EVs is fast charging. Um, you typically would use something like a, an accurate model to try and predict what the degradation would be when you charge using different ways of charging. Yeah. Um, but if I could also flip to grid batteries, so with a grid battery, it's yeah, quite interesting I mean. because you know grid battery, you've got you've got full control of when you charge and discharge and what the power levels would be. And grid batteries can be used to deliver lots of different services to the power grid. So if I just pick one example, um, which is just trading energy. So there are there are markets for electricity, for energy, and the price goes up and down. Yeah, And if you're a big enough player, you can charge when the price is low and discharge when the price is high. And uh, this is very interesting. I mean, particularly at the moment in the UK, we've actually got such a surplus of solar and wind uh, and low demand that um, often the prices are going negative. Uh, and so that means you actually get paid to charge your battery. <laughs> um, so what, uh, what you want to be able to do is... Uh, optimally charge and discharge your battery, um, but constrained by the physics of how much it's going to heat up and how long it's going to last and make sure you don't degrade the lifetime too much. And you need kind of models to do that. And we uh, we work on those kind of models and those kind of control problems. Yeah. So how far can an electric car go at the moment on a, is, is there such a thing as a typical charge? I know this is part of what you're looking at, but um, how far could I get to at the moment? Yeah, well, I guess it depends which electric car you've got, but um, typically yeah. about <laughs> about four miles per kilowatt hour. So, uh, you know, if you wanted to pick a round number. So, for example, if you've got a 50 kilowatt hour battery pack, that's roughly 200 mile range. Now, of course, that's going to change depending on how you drive. So if you're a pretty aggressive driver and you like to uh, floor it, then that's going to come down. Same as a normal car. Uh, the fuel yeah. efficiency could be better at lower speeds on the highways or whatever. Um, uh, but yeah, four miles per kilowatt hour. Now, to put that into perspective, um, uh, some of the first generation EVs had like 20 to 30 kilowatt hour battery packs. So that gives you a range of maybe 100 miles, um, which is actually is OK for like driving around town, but not so good if you need to go out of town and then come back or whatever. Um, but the new ones are, are closer to the 50 kind of level, 50 kilowatt hours. Um, so it's more like 200 miles and then maybe bigger than that, 60 70 and then it starts to look pretty similar to a normal car yeah yeah no that's really interesting and uh yeah as you're saying sort of for journeys around town i guess what quite a few people will be thinking is that maybe we need a bit of a change in infrastructure as well for, with more charging points and all that kind of thing and a general kind of culture shift as you say to more people using electric bikes and that kind of thing so um yeah, yeah. it's really fascinating thinking about how all that will fit together um so I think we're sort of drawing towards the end of our half an hour. Um, maybe I'll just sort of finish by 
asking you what you're most excited about at the moment in your research then because you've been talking about all these different areas so you can feel free to ask more, uh, talk more about your uh, grid research and whatever you fancy what's exciting in the, the battery intelligence lab right now. Yeah, great. Um, so excited about lots of things. I guess if I was to pick a couple of areas, the stuff I mentioned earlier about trading energy using batteries on the power grid is pretty exciting um, because it's uh, it's an area that's kind of new. Um, so tr traditionally, when you've put, well, well, I say traditionally, <laughs> five years ago, when you put a battery on a power grid, uh, that shows how fast things are changing. Five years ago, it would have done something in the UK, at least, called frequency response, which basically means you inject power according to how the frequency is deviating away from 50 hertz in the UK. Um, but this, that's only one of the possible applications. And now, now that you can do things like trading energy as well, it opens up a whole host of other challenges and things to look at. So I'm pretty interested in that um, mm -hmm. and that kind of confluence, if you like, of uh, forecasting prices, thinking about degradation of the battery and the physics, thinking about the markets and how you access them and all of that. Um, um, and then uh, other things, sorry, <laughs> as luck would have it, someone, <laughs> someone is trying to phone me on Skype at the same time. They've, oh, they've I just, see. <laughs> they've seen, I don't know how you set a do not disturb, but anyway. Um, uh, the other we thing we've here, done right? quite a bit of work on is uh, machine learning and health prediction of battery life um, and uh, I think that's kind of an area that's exploded in the last couple of years as well and there's lots of papers coming out on that which is great um, although I think extrapolating those results is is, is prone to uh, difficulty and so I'm quite interested in kind of bringing together a physical understanding with a kind of data-driven understanding and thinking about how those two things fit together. Um, so there's that's a couple of thoughts. That's a lot, that's, that's yeah. really great. We'll have to stay tuned and um, you've got a website for your lab group, haven't you? So uh, we can keep an eye out and, and post about exciting things going on. Um, we just had one question come in about whether electric cars plugged in overnight might be used as part of grid storage, um, which was an interesting point and something I was talking to somebody about the other way, uh, other day, sorry. Um, I don't know if you've time yeah. to quickly answer that one. Yeah, oh, definitely. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's a really good thought, actually, and it's a thought that lots of uh, companies and lots of people have, have been having. And you can imagine, you know, if, if 10 million people have EVs and they're all plugged in, uh, that could actually offer quite a big service to the grid. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I guess one thing to say about that is, you know, when you cycle a battery, it does use up some of its lifetime. So that would have to be done in such a way that it's um, carefully constrained not to waste too much of the battery's potential lifetime. Um, but yeah, in principle, it can be done and it can offer a variety of uh, positive benefits from supporting the local power network to uh, supporting the national kind of network. Um, I think today what people do, which probably makes a lot of sense, is just to offer their electric car as a kind of load which can be charged at different times. So instead of saying, like, I'm going to allow, allow power to flow in and out of the car, which is called V to G or vehicle to grid, um, yeah. actually just saying, look, I need this to be full by tomorrow morning, but I don't care when it happens. Um, that then allows some flexibility to use that in the best way from the grid's point of view, but without having to have the bi-directional power transfer. Yeah. Oh, really interesting stuff. Um, thank you very much. Um, I am aware Pleasure. that there are questions which have come in which we haven't had time to answer, um, but I don't know if uh, perhaps you'd be happy maybe to pop onto YouTube later and type out a sentence in response. Um, otherwise, people can maybe tweet you. Um, you're, you're on Twitter, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Uh, happy to answer questions on Twitter. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, perfect. Um, so that's wonderful. Well, uh, in which case, thank you so much. That was a really interesting discussion. And I've definitely learned a lot about batteries. And it's been really fascinating to hear everything that you're up to. Uh, in terms of other things we have going on at Sparks, now we are moving into the summer months. We're going to be doing these live Q&As every week. Uh, so our next Q&A will be next Tuesday at 2 p.m. and that's going to be with Professor Tamsin Mather from the Earth Sciences Department and she's going to be talking all about volcanoes, what it's like to be going uh, to be a volcanologist and all that kind of thing. Um, and if you can't wait quite that long, on Friday at quarter past three, um, the university will be doing a um, 
they're calling them live tutorial events with Eleanor Stride, Professor Eleanor Stride, who is in the Department of Engineering. Uh, I'm sure David knows of her and she does fascinating research into how drugs can be delivered into the body um, using biomedically engineered bubbles. It's really interesting. So I'd definitely recommend that you tune into that so you can follow the university on Twitter and Facebook uh, if you want to get updates about that. Otherwise, please do follow us at Oxford Sparks on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, as I said at the start, and you'll be the first to know about all of our events. Um, so, yeah, just bye bye from me and from David, and we'll look forward to seeing you again next week. Bye bye. bye. Thanks. <laughs>